have to apologize to poor Andrew first. It wasn't his fault that I couldn't find that note. I told him to play the wrong one. So first of all, that key was in my upper sky room. That's why I couldn't find the note. So I apologize. It's not your fault. It's my fault. I told you the wrong one. <laughs> I halfway through the song, I realized it was the wrong key. I'm like, that is so not right. Uh, last year, the attendance of all Major League Baseball parks was about 75 million. 75 million people attended baseball games throughout the year. This year, you ready for this one? This year, the total salary of all of those ball players, how much do you think? Just shy of three billion dollars. Just shy of three billion dollars. About two hundred and eighty-eight million or billion, two hundred and eighty-eight billion, roughly. It is unbelievable. That is just their salaries. That does not include front office. That does not include management. That does not include franchise fees. That doesn't include profits. We're just talking about the salaries of the guys that play the game. That's a lot. Okay? Not only does it not include management, front office, and all of these other things, it doesn't include the NBA, the NHL, the NFL, the Major League Soccer Association, TV, movies, cable. You see where I'm going with all of this? Culture dominates what we do. Culture dominates everything. There are so many entertainment outlets for us to spend our money on. And to say that culture reigns in our country is the biggest understatement I could ever make this year. It is the biggest understatement. What I'm saying is not that we can't have fun. Don't hear me wrong, okay? We can have fun. It's good to have fun. It's good to go out and spend time with the family and, and enjoy ourselves. But we need to seriously pay attention to what we pay the most attention to. That's the point. The reason all of these people make so much, how many times do I hear people say, oh, it's disgusting that out of the went to the angels for $250 million. We pay a salary. <laughs> There's nobody to blame but you and me. We're the ones who pay the money for his jerseys and, and the, the Cardinals paraphernalia and, and the MLB wear it. I mean, we're the ones that pay. You know, we go to the movies and rent the movie, movies and you know, these actors get paid you know, $50 million to do a movie. We pay their salaries. There's a reason they make that much. Just saying. Today we're going to talk about apostasy. Today we are going to talk about apathy. More over apostasy, but um, they are very similar things. Uh, flip with me if you would to Hebrews 10. And we're kind of going to be all over the board in Hebrews this morning. If you get to James, you went too far. If you hit 1 Corinthians, you've got not gone far enough. Hebrews 10. We're going to be in verse... Ouch, that was my knuckle. Um, verse 19. I'm going to read through to, to uh, verse 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has inaugurated for us through the curtain, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and 
full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us be con concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is not the sermon I intended for this section. I was actually going after verses 24 and 25. Do not stay away from the meetings as some of you habitually have done. And I titled the sermon originally, a year ago, God versus Sporting Events. I just, I was really on a roll for that one. I, I was ready to, you know, take that one into high gear. But as I started studying this week, Something different popped out at me, and that kind of has a tendency to happen. You see, I saw and studied that verses 19, 20, and 21 are in summation of what happens in chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. They are a summation of what the writer of Hebrews is going through. Flip with me back a page or two to Hebrews 5, 11. If you've got a study Bible, it'll be more than a couple pages. For me, it's it's two. Hebrews 5.11. This is where this whole section gets started. I'm only going to read a, a portion of this. I'm not going to read the whole section, but I'm going to read a portion of this beginning sentence, uh, verse uh, 11 in chapter 5. We have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain since you have become slow to understand. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of God, God's revelation. You need milk, not solid food. Not everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message of righteous, righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Therefore, leaving the elementary message about the Messiah, let us go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about ritual washings, or baptism in that case, uh, laying on of hands the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. And we will do this if God permits. That's the beginning of this whole section here. Apostasy is the renunciation of faith or abandonment of a loyalty. That is apostasy. Okay? Apostasy means turning your back on something that you previously were very loyal to. Okay? Apathy, similar, but not the same. Apathy is the lack of enthusiasm or interest in something. Hear the difference? Apostasy is completely turning your back on it. Apathetic is just, you don't carry it away. Apathetic is actually the opposite of love. Uh, love is an action. Apathy is the opposite of that. Apathy, you just don't carry it away. You know, whatever. I, I just, I, I don't give two rips. Eh, whatever. Mainly, we're going to look at apostasy, although apathy does apply here as well. Now, because of the discussion on apostasy here in these verses, and the doctrine, the you know, verses, uh, chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are discussions of the theology of the doctrine of the light of Christ. These three verses here in chapter 10, 19, 20, and 21 are a summation of those chapters. Therefore, brothers, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, the temple. The temple was separated by a curtain. It was the most holy place where the, the Ark of the Covenant of God was. There was a curtain that separated it. Only the priest was allowed to go inside, and even he was not too comfortable with going inside. He had to go through all these ritual washings and purification 
blood that he shed. By the new and living way he has inaugurated for us through the curtain that is his flesh. That talks about that curtain I was just explaining. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, see, he's the high priest. He is the one who enters that sanctuary and intercesses for you and I. He is the one that does that. Not some human. It's him. It's Jesus. Jesus is the one that does that. So how do we respond to this truth of Christ that is preached here by the writer? Now, if we're committing apostasy or apathy, then what happens as we flip the page and go to verse 26, we're going to see that there is no sacrifice left. If we turn our back on Jesus, there is nothing left. If we're apathetic toward him, we're on our road to becoming apathy. Apathy is what happens right before apostasy. I see it as a natural progression. So if we're apathetic towards something, we need to watch it. We need to be careful. So how do we respond to the truth of Christ? How you respond tells a lot about the person. You know what the problem is? Most people who are um, commit apostasy and most people who are apathetic don't realize that they're doing it. That's the problem. There for a long time, I was in the same way. You know what, in my early 20s, when I was going through that rough patch in my life, I still knew God. I still had God as far as I was concerned. But I didn't realize that I had become, I had been committing apostasy. I had turned my back on God. I didn't realize it. I just didn't realize it. Until after the fact. You see, I thought I was all right. Most people who are committing apostasy and are apathetic towards Christ do not even realize that it's an issue. You know why? Ego. It's our own ego. That's why we don't realize it. We have to be humble and open ourselves up to the possibility that we are wrong. Now, moving on, the proper response to the truth of Christ is found in verses 22, 23, and 24, and 25. 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed in pure water. Response one is faith. That is how we respond to the truth of Christ. Okay? True uh, faith is an allegiance to a duty or a person, in our case, God. And being faithful, to be faithful, means having a steadfast affection or allegiance. Okay? Having no doubts about our salvation and the ability to get close to God, free from guilt, and having complete devotion to God because of what he has done through us, through Jesus. It is being completely and utterly committed to God by, because of what he has done for us for Jesus. Through Jesus. That's faith. Being completely committed to him. Being attached to him. Having an allegiance to Christ despite everything. Okay? Well, let's move on. Verse 23. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised, he, for he who promised is faithful. Response to hope. Well, let me tell you what, folks. I did not see faith, hope, and what's going to follow here. I didn't see it. It took a commentator for me to see all this. And this is the reason that the direction of my sermon completely changed. Because my eyes had been opened to something I had never seen before. You see, hope is to cherish a desire with anticipation. A desire that is accompanied by an expectation or a belief in fulfillment. Hope, essentially, is because we have the faith, we hold to the ability to get close to God, free from guilt, because we live in ex- 
expectancy of the fulfillment of the promises that he gives us. We live in expectancy that he's going to say, do what he says he's going to do. That's hope. That is exactly hope. All of the promises of God await us because of the hope and the faith that we profess. Verse 24. And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. Faith, hope, and love. Does that ring a bell? It should. 1 Corinthians 13. Faith, hope, and love remain. But the greatest of these is love. Love is the final response to the truth of Christ. Love is defined as an unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for the good of another. The object of attachment, devotion, or admiration. Did you notice what the three definitions tie together? Action. We have to, all, all three of them, faith requires that we respond. Hope requires that we actively anticipate what has been promised. Love means that we hold fast and act on that. Because of our faith and hope, we are to have an unwavering, unselfish love for God and for others. This means encouraging others. We need to be encouraged in a dark world. We don't need to be tearing each other down. We get enough of that from the world. We don't need to tear them down. We need to build up. We need to encourage. We have to shine Christ's light among our fellow brothers and sisters. And when we see somebody falling away, that means we go after them. It is our duty as a Christian to go after those who are lost and who we see falling away, falling away. We are to encourage them and teach them the ways of Christ. Verse 25, not staying away from our meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, we should be concerned about one another to promote love and good works. The question remains is, are we genuinely concerned about others, or are we concerned of our own agenda? That is the question. This past week, I, I wrote a blog on, on my, my blog site, on, on blogspot.com. It was not my intention to read this during the sermon, but as I started studying and reading more, this has become ever more relevant to exactly what we're talking about today. One of the things brewing for the past bit is the direction of the church here in Lima. Do we rely on God and do the work ourselves, or do we give it to the crossing and let them take it on? Well, here's my take. Either way, it's our responsibility. That is simply the crux of the matter. No one can work out your faith and relationship in Christ for you. You must do it. Simply put, we don't want to put in the time it is going to require to disciple somebody. It is a difficult task full of pain, strife, and time. Yet it is, the most, it is the most rewarding time, too. To see someone go from milk to meat is something that in the Christian walk means the world. Every time I go to serve others, it is them who minister to me. My eyes get open to the things I hadn't seen before. My ears get open to the things that I hadn't heard. And my feet take me places that I never thought possible. Oh, yes, change is inevitable. Do you resist the change, or are you willing to be uncomfortable for Christ? It doesn't matter if we decide to do this under our own abilities with God as a God, or whether God uses the crossing to come in here and make the necessary changes for us to be relevant. Either way, God will still use it. Either way, it is still up to us. It is our responsibility. And if we aren't willing to take on the task of building relationships for Christ, then it begs the question, are you really? Christian, do you really love Christ? It isn't designed to offend you. It isn't designed to make you mad. The question is there for you to seriously take on the task of discovering what is most important to you. There are things in the world that I hate giving up. I love golf, video games, and vegging out in front of a TV. However, if they get in the way of discipling someone, I must be willing to give them up. 
it is an affirmation of what we have already undertaken in our confession of baptism, or it is a denial of it. If we are not willing to take on relational discipleship and committing time for small groups and relationship building, then we need to reevaluate our walk with Christ. Did you catch that? It's more than working as a custodian at a church, serving at a fundraiser dinner, making a dessert once in a while for those events, or more than just devoting time within the walls of a church. It is about being active outside of these walls. It is about doing it every day of the week, not just here on Sunday. The point is this. Either way we go, whether the answer is the crossing or not, it is our responsibility to work out the salvation given to us by Christ. Your action, or lack thereof, will determine your answer. My prayer is that you read the, well, hear this. I used to say read this in here because it's on the blog. My prayer is that you hear this with an open mind and a heart and evaluate your actions or lack thereof. My friends, it is up to us to work out our salvation. Nobody can do that for us. We have to be constantly checking ourselves for apathy and apostasy because in my mind, they are so similar that they fall right upon one another. And if we find these anywhere, we have to eradicate them and seek help from God on how to do that. In verse 25, the author continues and talks about the love and good works, and and he mentions that some are out of the habit of meeting together. Fellowship, my friends, is absolutely vital to the walk of a Christian. It is essential to meet together on Sundays, but, there's a huge but there, but it isn't just about meeting together on Sundays. It's about meeting together for small groups and growth as well. We can't be missing worship on Sunday for just any regular excuse. I mean, things do come up. Okay, uh, We all understand that. But, you know, find another option if something does come up. Listen to the sermons online. I, I post the sermons on YouTube. Find a Saturday evening worship somewhere. It doesn't have to be here. We don't have a Saturday evening worship. Find one somewhere else. It's all right. If you're on vacation, go find another church to visit. You never know what you might find. You know, it might have some great thing that goes on that you can bring back. You know, we all, it's, we're learning from each other. There are always options. Next week, next week we're going to uh, talk about, it, we're going to kind of continue on this track. We're going to continue with um, Hebrews 5. I got a devotion this week that talked about the maturity of a Christian and a question that was posed by a 16-year-old girl. And we're going to talk about what a mature Christian and the different levels look like. And I'm going to send you home with a little... That's what's going to be in the bulletin next week. It'll be that little outline of a spiritual child, infant, a spiritual young person, and a spiritual mother and father. I'm going to send that home with you. You don't have to turn it back to me next week. But I want you to evaluate you in that. Because the maturity and our response to the truth of Christ matters. You see, we do everything we can to be sure that we do not miss our favorite TV show, our movie, or a sports team. We do everything we can to make sure that law and order is DVR'd so that we can see it.
your life? Or if the visitor is going to come and steal the show? My prayer this morning is that God is reigning in your life. It is such a difficult task to undertake the possibility that we might be doing something that isn't what God would design. It's a hard task. And I sit here and convict myself as I say these things because I am a diehard Cardinals fan. I just don't know what to do. Every last dog. 